Okay. Yep, we're good to go. Should I share my screen now? So, welcome everyone. So, this is the second session with Mori Park on fairness. So, good to go. So, Mori, the state is yours. All right, thank you very much. I'll uh, go ahead and share my screen. Uh, hopefully, that'll work. Um, yes, so I assume you can see my screen. Um, and I will jump into the second part of this tutorial on, on fairness and machine learning. Again, thanks for the organizers for having me. It's been, it's been a pleasure participating. And thanks for the audience. It's been a really engaged audience and I had a really interesting time in all the question sessions um, afterwards uh, you know, with, uh, with this group of students. Um, let me uh, see how I can uh, go into presenter mode. One quick second, there we go. All right, so part two. Uh, let's recap where we came from. So last time we discussed attempts to uh, define fairness or at least get a handle on what is unfair um, uh, by appealing to statistical properties of uh, you know, the joint distribution of your features X, your outcome Y, your risk score R, and status in a, in a designated protected group that could encode uh, race or gender or disability status and so forth. Um, and we discussed uh, the, uh, you know, the, the main fairness criteria that had been proposed in this limited setting. Uh, and three common ones were uh, the, the one called demographic parity, um, which equalizes acceptance rates. Uh, the other one, and, and you can write this as the scores independent of the uh, protected attribute. Um, error rate parity, which boils down to equal true, false, positive rates in all groups. Uh, as follows from a conditional independence statement. I'm just recapping them quickly. They won't be that relevant for today, but I just want this to be fresh on your mind. Um, and the third one was calibration or predictive parity, which means that you have an equal positive outcome rate given a score value in all groups. And this follows from a different conditional independence statement. That was the recap. Um, and I wanna also repeat the example that I gave last time because that's tying into the topic of uh, this talk and, and what we wanna talk about today. And that's the question, is prediction too narrow? And what are our alternatives to prediction? And so uh, the scholarly debate around uh, this risk score, for instance, Compass that's used in recidivism prediction uh, was largely about the tension between these fairness criteria. And there are also data and measurement problems involved that have been discussed. But the issue I wanted to highlight is not how we predict, but is it a problem that we frame this as a prediction pro problem in the first way? So I want to draw attention to the problem formulation. And I made this example using the uh, case of failure to appear in court, where one approach is to frame this as a prediction problem and uh, predict failure to be in court and, and jail uh, defendants if the risk is high. An alternative is to understand the causes of failing to appear in court and uh, you know, such as you know, lack of transportation, lack of childcare, and addressing those uh, root causes and implementing steps to mitigate those. And that was also part of a settlement uh, in Harris County, uh, mitigating this alternative that I found compelling. So examples like these um, it led me to question a few years ago this uh, standard view of learning and decision making, where we kind of start from a data and we accept the data as given. The data is just, you know, this is the joint distribution. We're not going to ask questions about that. We're not going to change that. We're not going to try to get a different distribution. We're just accepting the data as it is. And we're putting some kind of learning process on top of that, some kind of smoothing and interpolation, some statistics, machine learning. And then we get a model, such as a predictor, and we use that to make decisions. And maybe we have like uh, some cost function for our decisions, like a cost for false positives, a cost for, cost for false negatives but we're pr pretty oblivious for how this fits in, okay? And so what's missing from this picture is the whole surrounding story of, of what goes around this. And this is where uh, my, you know, as I just mentioned, my role model, Ursula Franklin comes in. She wrote in 1989 that technologies are developed and used within a particular social context, uh, social, economic, and political context. They arise out of a social structure. They're grafted onto it and they may reinforce or destroy it often in ways that are neither foreseen nor foreseeable. She continues that uh, context is not a passive medium, but a dynamic counterpart 
the individuals, uh, the responses of people individually and collectively and the responses of nature are often underrated in the formulations of plans and predictions. So she's saying that not only are we ignoring, uh, you know, context when we're making our predictions, this thing that we call context is also not a passive, a static creature, but a dynamic counterpart, something that is about the responses of, of people. Um, and it's, it's that dynamic element that can invalidate our predictions. And so trying to draw a picture, and this is a highly imperfect picture, but trying to draw, draw a picture uh, about this story um, is that social decisions in the real world might look a little bit more like this, okay? So you still have your data and learning and, and model in there, but you use the model decisions and you're mindful of how these decisions affect individuals and how in turn individuals respond or interact with your model uh, as you make these decisions. And then you also pay attention to how individuals, uh, you know, make up the state of the world and make up, you know, what becomes future data through measurement, okay? And so there is a closed feedback loop that our data and model and operate in and the people and in, in, uh, in the world and this is a sort of the, the extended picture that we're trying to capture and that uh, Franklin is, is drawing attention to. And so um, what I wanted to do in this talk is um, highlight two research directions that were motivated by this broader perspective, okay? And the first one is about causality. And I'm gonna ask the question, can we capture a social context the surrounding stuff, social facts about the world and how things happen. Can we capture that through causal models? And then what can causality say about questions of discrimination and fairness? The second one is about dynamical systems. And I'm gonna ask if we can formalize these socio-technical systems, the th stuff that I just drew, uh, the Franklin story, if we can formalize that using uh, the language of dynamical systems and control theory and so on. And how can we use this perspective to reason about things like feedback and long-term effects? I should say that um, there are other notable approaches to take social context into account. For instance, this first paper that I wrote with Cynthia Dwork uh, and uh, Tony Pitassi, Omar Rangold and Rich Seymour in 2012 um, about individual fairness that used something called a similarity measure over individuals that was specifically meant to in, in sort of incorporate facts about society um, sort of uh, and, and knowledge about the world. So this was an attempt to bring in social context. Um, and so these aren't the only causality and, and dynamical systems aren't the only ways that people have tried to take social context into account. So these are just the ones that I'm going to focus on in, in this talk. All right, let me start with causal modeling and fairness. And that's something I've been thinking about for the last four years, and I still don't have great answers. So this talk is maybe a bit of a letdown in that I'm not gonna give you definitive answers on, uh, on this topic. And I'm not gonna, um, and I'm in some sense gonna involve you in my ongoing thought process. And this is a little bit open-ended, but the advantage for me at least is that all of you smart PhD students listening in can uh, help me think about this and, and can make progress on this. And, and hopefully they'll get me unstuck on a lot of these things. This is also loosely based on a chapter on causality that I wrote for this uh, book that is available at fairmelbook.org. And so it makes sense um, to start with, um, when talking about this topic, to start with a venerable example of UC Berkeley grad admissions from 1973. And many of you have probably heard this example uh, many times because it comes up in a bunch of different contexts, but I'm gonna give it, you a little bit of a different take on it. So maybe it'll be new, even if you've seen this. Um, so there was this paper by Bickle, Hamill and, uh, and um, O'Connell um, about sex bias in graduate admissions, data from UC Berkeley. And this was from 1973. And the data shows uh, that there was a male acceptance rate at the graduate admissions level of 44% and a female acceptance rate of 30%. And people were rightfully concerned about this disparity uh, and whether this disparity is a sign of uh, sex bias in graduate admissions, okay? And this was true also among the top six departments. So let's restrict our attention to the top six departments just so that we don't get into sort of small sample size issues. Okay, so let's only look at the top six departments and then the, um, the situation was something like this. So Bickle actually split up uh, the applications 
by these six uh, top six departments, and he uh, noticed the following. So they noticed that actually in the largest department, um, the uh, male acceptance rate was 62%, and the female acceptance rate was much higher. It was 82%. Similarly, in the second largest department, the female acceptance rate was higher. And the third one, it was about the same, but slight bias toward the men. Third one, a fourth one was about the same, but slight bias for, uh, for women. Uh, and the fifth largest, slight bias for men and so on. Um, so, but if you look at this split up by department, you see that the this uh, apparent uh, inequality uh, seems to have reversed. So here there is, appears to be an evidence or, or a slight advantage for female applicants in, in terms of admission rates. And so this is often cited as an example of Simpson's paradox, whereby if you, you know, look at disaggregate the data, you take an aggregate statistic and you, you, know, you, you split it up by some variable here at department, then the, uh, the uh, inequality you saw in aggregate disappears and might even reverse, okay? So this is a well-known phenomenon in statistics, sometimes called Simpson's paradox. Let me check if there's audio question because the 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 chat uh, just lit up. Uh, so there's a question here. Okay, this is just me Jung instructing folks. Yeah, so feel free like last time to um, ask questions, interrupt me, and and uh, I'll try to get to them. So yeah, this was the this was the data, <clears throat> and Bickel had an explanation for this data. So he wrote. Uh, the bias in the aggregated data stems not from any pattern of discrimination on the part of the admissions committees, which seems quite fair on the whole, but apparently from prior screening at earlier levels of the educational system. Women are shunted by their socialization and education toward fields of graduate study that are generally more crowded, less productive of completed degrees, and less funded, well-funded, and that frequently offer poorer professional employment prospects. So his story was that there is no discrimination, but uh, rather, women, uh, by their uh, socialization and their preferences, uh, shaped by their uh, socialization, um, uh, you know, apply to more competitive departments, apply to departments that have a lower acceptance rate, and hence appear to be rejected at higher rates. But that's only because by their preference, they're applying to, uh, you know, um, uh, more competitive departments. So that's the that was the uh, the supposed explanation of this uh, this data, uh, and a few years uh, later, uh, Pearl picked this up um, and uh, it's appeared in his causality book, um, where he said, you know, uh, in the chapter of uh, on on Simpson's paradox, he gives this example and uh, he uh, tells a causal story. Okay, he says, okay, Bickel was basically trying to tell us a causal story. He's trying to tell us that you know there's this uh, you know directed acyclic graph here. Uh, that has a gender node and here coded as male, female, um, a department choice node and an admissions node. And um, what Pearl pointed out is that department choice here mediates the influence of gender on admissions. And moreover, um, Pearl argues that discrimination is the direct effect of gender on admission. So we should think of discrimination as this bottom link um, that directly, where, whereby gender has a direct uh, influence on, on admissions. And we should not think of discrimination as this indirect influence uh, or indirect uh, causal effect that goes through a department. Okay, so that's the normative position here is that discrimination is the direct effect. Okay, and so this was the causal interpretation of Bickel's story. And so one thing that I wanna um, point out, which is not the main point of my talk, but one thing I wanna point out on the side is that there are normative problems with uh, framing discrimination as a direct effect. It roughly, if you will, captures the disparate treatment doctrine and the law that I uh, mentioned last time, and it th therefore inherits its pitfalls. So it's unable to detect many salient forms of discrimination uh, and even legally recognized forms of discrimination. So not just moral uh, you know, hazards that uh, it doesn't detect, but it also doesn't detect all legally recognized forms of discrimination. In particular, it is defeated by direct indirect discrimination. And my first reaction to uh, you know, Bickel's story was always, well, wait a minute, why do you think that's a good thing that uh, there is, the, why do you think of this uh, department choice note as disarming concerns of discrimination? My thought would have been that what shapes preferences uh, might be 
that, you know, for instance, uh, departments compensate women uh, more poorly than men, or because the department has a, a track record of harmful policies and treatment of women. And so who says that what shapes your socialization or what shapes your department preferences is your socialization or some inherent preference that you have by virtue of your gender. Maybe really what's happening is that the department just has a bad track record. Uh, and that's, that's why you're, you have a preference not to go there or you're even afraid of going there, there despite your intellectual interest. So I never thought this was a compelling resolution to the discrimination story. Okay, so why do we think that department choice as a mediator disarms concerns of discrimination? That is a, is a strong normative position about this causal diagram that doesn't come out of anything, uh, for any first principles as far as it can see. That is just a position you will have to take on if you want. So what about other causal fairness criteria? If not direct effects, uh, what else can we do? Uh, and this has led to much work on causal fairness criteria and past specific effects. So um, Matt Kuzner and others introduced something like counterfactual fairness that was sort of meant to be causal fairness criterion. Um, uh, others uh, started doing these path specific analyses of, you know, maybe this path you should consider discrimination and that path you shouldn't and how do you eliminate discriminatory pathways in your, in your predictors and so on. And that's a whole lot of work going on there that uh, is interesting and, 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 and important. And uh, there was a survey by uh, Chiapa and Isaac that you could uh, can read uh, and for, for a lot of uh, information on this line of work, as well as uh, in chapter four of this book, I, I work through that literature and some of the ideas in it. Um, but that's not the, the main uh, thing I wanna talk about in this tutorial today. There is a bigger, or not necessarily a bigger problem, but a different problem that I want to focus on. Okay, so again, this is a, an interesting line of work. There's good technical work here that I want to distract from, but there is a different problem I want to focus on. And that, um, you know, problem that I want to get into just kind of slaps you on the head when you read, um, uh, you know, the, a passage from uh, Pearl's fantastic book, uh, The Book of Why, that I'm sure many of you have read, and that's uh, a beautiful account of causality Then you know, I devoured this book. Um, and I struggled a little bit with this passage about the Berkeley example, because Pearl in this book tries to describe what the direct effect of X, your gender, on Y, your admissions means, okay? So he tries to sort of say in words what that direct, effects it, direct effect is. And the first explanation he offers on page 317 is, we get the direct effect of X, uh, uh, on Y when we wiggle X here gender with allow without allowing M here department to change. So we should wiggle the gender variable without allowing department to change. Okay, so that's one interpretation. The other interpretation he offers is hold constant the variable department and then tweak the variable gender. And the third uh, he uh, uh, sort of verbal frame uh, phrasing he chooses is force everybody to apply to the history department, randomly assign some people to report their sex as male. Uh, and so here it's more about misreporting. And again, then a page later, it's about people who would be admitted if she faked her sex to read male. And so I was reading this and I was really struggling to, to, to figure out what, what is this a no gender in that graph? Is it the uh, reported sex of the candidate? Is it the box they tick on the application form? But of course, the, the, the pen stroke, the box you tick has no causal powers. That's some downstream variable. And then if you're really referring about the construct of gender, what does it mean to wiggle that? What does it mean to tweak that? So I, I, I couldn't quite figure out what, what the gender node is really referring to, okay? And so this led me to um, consider two neglected problems in, in causal modeling that I wanna draw your attention to. The first one is what I call the ontological problem. And that's the simple question of what is the thing that a node in a causal graph references? What is the ontological entity that we point to uh, when we draw a node with a certain name? What is the thing uh, that we uh, intend to reference there? And the second one is what I call the epistemological problem, which is how do we come to know facts about this thing? So once we provided clarity 
um, about what the thing is that we intend to reference in a causal model. The second question is, how do we come to uh, accept facts about this thing? Okay. And so um, I will focus on the former problem, the ontological problem, because I think to me that comes first, even though the epistemological problem is also important. I will illustrate the ontological problem with a lighthearted example, and I hope you don't uh, mind that. Um, and then I will argue why this is a serious problem that we cannot ignore and that has serious theoretical and practical import um, and consequences. Okay, so here's my, my example, just to get you thinking about ontology. So suppose this is, uh, you know, an encounter that happens in the world. The, the gentleman on the right is applying for a job and he approaches this manager and he says, you know, how do you do good, sir? I'm here to apply for your job. And the manager says, uh, rejected, that's it. All right, game over, you're rejected. Um, and the, uh, the, the, you know, the gentleman goes home and is like, oh, you know, uh, I was rejected. I'm, I'm bummed out, I was rejected. And you know, his friend says, you know, he was rejected because he's a hipster. You know, he, this, is, this is it, he was rejected because he's a hipster and that's not, that's not fair. As in being a hipster caused him to be rejected, okay? And the manager says, oh, no, no, not at all. I, I love all hipsters in the world. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of hipsters really, but you know, he just didn't meet the dress code uh, that we require from our employees. And so it was really his clothing, okay? So the manager says that his clothing caused him to be rejected, okay? And so then you have to like, uh, to tell a causal story around this, you have to ask yourself the question, what is a hipster, right? And how do you create a node called hipster in a causal diagram? And so I looked up what is a hipster and I found this helpful guide called the anatomy of an Oakland hipster. Uh, so I live near Oakland and apparently this is what hipsters look, up, look, look like in my neighborhood. They carry a, um, you know, uh, a typewriter in their left arm and they push a fixie in their right hand and they smoke American, American spirit and they get their haircuts onto Maskell Alley. So it's awfully specific what a hipster in Oakland is, right? And it you know, references all sorts of things specific to uh, Oakland. Um, and so if you go to Portland, uh, hipsters look very different. So this Canadian lumberjack was accidentally voted Portland's hipster of the year. And so apparently in Portland, uh, you know, hipsters look more like Canadian lumberjacks. And if you go to Merriam Webster, oh, sorry, I should say that, you know, maybe the best definition of hipster I've heard uh, from my friend uh, Nikhil Srivastava, who's a Berkeley math professor, uh, is that a hipster is a person who diagonalizes against stereotypes. So a hipster will try to enumerate all stereotypes that exist in society. So all, all social facts that we consider are stereotypes. And uh, he will try to like flip one bit on each of them. So he will make sure that he defies every single uh, stereotype. Um, so I think that's a great definition. Um, the original definition though by Merriam-Webster is that a hipster is a person that, uh, you know, carried a hip, uh, a flask uh, on, on, on their hip during the prohibition, during times of prohibition. Okay, so this was apparently the original definition. And so the point I wanna illustrate here is that, um, let, me, let me go back because there's, um, there was a question and I wanna make sure I miss this. Uh, so there, there's some question in the chat and also Q and A, yeah. Yeah, so there, there are some good questions here. So the first one by Abhijit is, um, do you think Bickle intentionally stressed on the word discrimination on the part of the admission committees uh, as opposed to discrimination by university in general? Yeah, good point, good subtlety, yeah. So discrimination by whom is a great question, right? And so, um, you know, for instance, do you wanna draw a separation between uh, a department that, you know, pays women less, uh, but an admissions committee that is totally fair and unbiased, whatever that means, right? So you could sort of try to entertain such distinctions and, and maybe that, that's what they had in mind. Um, just a thought, is this in any way connected to intersectionality where we are considering two factors at the same time, department and gender? Um, I think it's, it's, you know, that comes up, intersectionality can play a role in these considerations for sure. But uh, I think this one is more about, you know, what are called mediation. So you're trying to sort of, uh, you know, provide an explanation for the data in terms of a mediating variable like department, hoping that that will uh, disarm concerns of discrimination. Okay, 
And Mirko points out, caution, the Canadian hipster might be a hoax. The Postillion is a satire magazine in, um, in Germany. That's true. It's, it's a joke article. Let me, so I'm not accused of spreading fake news. This is uh, a, a, a satirical argument. It's not an article. It's not, it's not a real thing. No, there, no Canadian lumberjack became Portland hipster of the year, just, just to be very clear. Um, and more, so there's um, another question in q and I don't know if you can see the question. The Q&A I can't see because I would have to close uh, my... Um, uh, okay, my, so I, let, uh, let me read the question to you then. Um, so this is a question from Sophia. So she said, if there are fewer top candidates, then the top department will take them to get gender ratio T even out. That seems compatible with PO models. Sorry, I, I didn't parse the question. Um, can you, um, how about we return to that again? Like just send it, okay. uh, Sophia, I, I'm curious about your question and please uh, send it uh, again in the chat toward the end and we'll chat about it because I also want to move on. So, yeah. um, and for the rest on the, on, the, on the video, please send your messages in the chat because mm -hmm. the QA, I can only see if I leave my presentation and I don't want to do that. Okay, so please ask that on the chat and I'll get to that in a moment. So let me move on a little bit, just uh, so we get to some more, cover some more ground before we have more discussion here. Um, so the, the, the issue that I wanna highlight attention or, or draw your attention to is one of ontological instability. I cannot just create a causal model uh, about hipsters and rejection and mediating variables because there is ontological uh, uncertainty or instability about what um, a hipster really is. And this is from a uh, distinction from uh, Ron Mellon's book, The Construction of Human Kinds and Hacking's uh, uh, wonderful article, Making Up People. One uh, source of instability is just that our norms and theories change. Society, you know, time passes, society changes. And what we consider uh, to be hipster, as you can see, obviously changed. Uh, the other source is uh, what is called hacking instability, that individuals respond to our classifications and existing categories break down as a result. There's this kind of looping effect uh, that hacking uh, describes. And I think that becomes very clear. This is why I like the hipster example and the, the definition of uh, diagonalizing against stereotypes because a hipster will actively try to defy uh, what the category is in some sense. Okay, so also let me make the point that ontology really matters just for causal modeling, right? So suppose we have a hypothetical ontology of uh, hipster where you try to substantiate that hipster is a trait that influences various things like facial hair, clothing, place of residence, and so on. And you try to draw your causal model like this based on, on your ontological understanding of hipster that you committed to. Then you, you will see that clothing becomes a mediator. It's a, a downstream consequence of, uh, of, of the hipster trait that uh, the person has, okay? And so you would have to make this a, a mediator. Um, and then, you know, the question is, what are all the other mediators that are important for this decision? The other mediators that could encode or not encode discrimination. And it becomes challenging to sort out all these, these mediating variables and what they mean. The second hypothetical ontology is that you assume that hipster is a social construct. Okay, so hipster is socially constructed, uh, meaning that it's a category that comes about by uh, you know, uh, shared practices of, of, of society and, and, and social, social uh, uh, facts about, uh, about the category. And it doesn't follow from some kind of biological theory of some inherent trait. Um, and so in this view, clothing is part of what constitutes the category of hipster. It's part of what it means to be a hipster. You cannot, you know, necessarily even separate it because it doesn't make sense to you know, talk about a hipster that's dressed like a, a you know, um, somebody else, right? And, and so clothing is sort of becomes part of that. But if you had to draw a diagram, it might look like this. You would say that clothing influences whether or not somebody considers you a hipster. And now you have all these confounding variables between being a hipster and a decision that come from your commitment to this ontology. And you need to understand all the confounding variables between hipster and, and, and the decision. And so ontology really matters. In ontology one, clothing is a mediator. In ontology two, clothing is a confounder. And as, as Pearl makes very clear, you know, there's this quote in his book, as you surely know by now, mistaking a mediator for a confounder is one of the deadliest sins in causal inference. It may lead to the most outrageous error. 
The letter invites adjustment, the format forbids it. So you've learned in the causality tutorial this week that mediators and confounders are very different and you shouldn't treat them the same way. In particular, you shouldn't adjust for uh, one uh, and you should adjust for the other, okay? But the bigger problem is, you know, ignoring this graphical structure, why can we even make hipster a node in the first place? What does it reference? What are its settings? What are the hipster settings? Uh, and, and why do you think this is a, a node, a, a modular mechanism uh, that you can put in your, in your causal graph? Okay, so you might say at this point, uh, and maybe this is a good time to take one more question. Uh, so uh, Sophia's question is, if there are fewer top candidates, then the top departments will take them to get gender ratio to even out. That seems compatible with Pearl's model. Uh, right, except I think, um, you know, you have to specify which department you uh, you apply to. Uh, so maybe I'm misunderstanding, but let's take that offline. And so the um, se the second question is, do you uh, what does it say? Um, oh, okay, so you you uh, you you took back that question. Okay, good. So that that's that's it for these questions for now. Um, so let, let me, you know, in case you're worried about me making this about a toy example and just being being unreasonable here and frivolous, um, let me move towards serious examples, very serious examples, and this you know, touches on on real questions of discrimination. You know, let's say you, you're trying to uh, talk about a claim like she was rejected because of her religion. You will find the exact same difficulty here, right? So you, again, you could say religion is your religious affiliation is an attribute of yours, it's a feature of yours that influences other things, right? Depending on your religion, you may be steered away from getting a college degree or you may, may be steered towards a college degree. Um, and so that's one way of thinking about it, religion as an attribute. There's actually a recent paper by Zhang and Berenboim where they draw the causal graph like this. They say, actually, you know, if you get a college degree, you might lose your religion because you learn about, you know, you hang out with lots of people that are atheists and, and, and don't have a religious affiliation and, and, and you, you you change your religious affiliation based on the education that you receive. Okay, so my point is, you know, these competing models are not questions about what the graphical structure is. They are actually manifestations of the suppressed question of what religion really references in the first place, right? The reason why we don't know how to draw this is because we don't know what this religion node really references and how we come to believe facts about what this references. Uh, and this is sort of a suppressed question. We, we talk about this under the guise of what is the graphical structure, but there is a more elementary problem of what is the node even in the first place? And why do we think there is such a node? And this is particularly important for the, the topic of race. And whenever you want to include race in a causal model or make claims about causal claims about race, this is a deep, difficult question. Okay, so what do we reference when you put race in a causal claim or a causal model? What do you want to reference for that? Um, we know that race is a social construct. It's not, you know, what race is does not follow from a biological theory. You cannot just put a race node in your causal model and hope that, you know, biology will tell you the mechanisms of that. That's not, that's debunked. That's not where, where, where the scholarship is. And so if you want to read about the metaphysics of, of race, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, you know, should start with, or you should consider the work of Haslinger, uh, you know, who made important contributions here. Here are some, some of the works that you could start with. I also found it helpful to read this book by Ron Mellon that I mentioned earlier, and scholarship by Kai Sean Spencer. And there's also lots of political philosophy uh, and philosophy of race. Uh, Shelby Mills and Paya are important scholars to mention here. So there's decades of scholarship of this that's very important, that's sort of important in debunking misconceptions about race, you know, pseudoscience about race that's been used to justify harmful discriminatory, discriminatory patterns uh, over, over uh, uh, long parts of our history and continue to do so. So um, this is fundamentally important for this topic. And all that comes up in, you know, when you need to decide what this node is, right? And so 
I'm really struggling with this and I'm, I'm really, I've really been, uh, you know, um, challenged by this and, 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 and stuck on this point. Um, and so I've been thinking, where can we go from here? Okay, so I don't want this to be defeatist. I don't want to be pessimistic and I don't want to do, I don't want to stop doing causality. I think uh, I will make a case for why we should continue making causal statements about discrimination. But there's a bit of a question of where do we go from here? And you could have a defeatist position and you could have this fallback position uh, that was articulated by Holland in 1986, who said, put as bluntly and as contentiously as possible in this article, I take the position that causes are only those things that could in principle be treatments and experiments. The only way for an attribute to change its value is for the unit to change in some way and no longer be the same unit. Statements of causation that involve attributes as causes are always statements of association between the values of an attribute and a response variable across the units in a population. So Holland argues that, you know, when we talk about immutable characteristics, these things can never be causes. Uh, they, you know, we just sort of make statements of association, even if we try to talk them talk about them as causes. And so that that led to this whole decades of like debate uh, around manipulation and causality that I don't want to rehash because in some sense, I always thought that it's a bit of a proxy debate um, because in my opinion, uh, laying out an experimental mechanism of manipulation is a way that we hope to certify that the construct has a stable enough ontology that permits it to become a cause. So we, we, we think that this experimental mechanism is so important because that endows the construct with its causal powers. By saying how you manipulate it, you, you, you sort of ascribe and certify the causal powers of the construct. And, and Pearl rightfully points out that this is not the only way we can try to certify that, okay? Manipulation is not necessary for things to become causes. The statement, the earthquake caused the house to collapse is completely uncontroversial because our physical understanding of the causal process here is so mature and so stable that they, they, you know, we don't need to be able to manipulate uh, you know, earthquakes. We don't need to be able to uh, you know, uh, randomly cause them or do some kind of RCT to figure out that they collapse buildings. That's not, that's not where it's at. However, for social constructs, gender, race, uh, and so forth, it's not clear what this kind of argument uh, would look like. And there is a beautiful article by Hirschman and Reed that I uh, uh, recommend that you read called Formation Stories and Causality and Sociology, where they specifically talk about this idea of a formation story, which is the argument you need to make uh, to, to say how something becomes a cause, okay? And how, how you, you know, why you think that, uh, something can be uh, can become a cause. Okay, so they call this a formation story and I like that expression. And so what we're lacking in causality right now are these formation stories. You know, how do we, how do we, how do we certify that something can become a cause? And so, you know, let me ask sort of bluntly, you know, is this just getting so complicated that we should give up on social constructs as causes, right? Should we stop talking about, uh, you know, race as a cause or gender as a cause and so on? And I'd argue this would be a serious loss and I wouldn't want to go there um, in part because causal statements have serious political, social and legal significance, right? It's not just, you know, a theoretical exercise. This is how we can hold, uh, you know, people accountable and how we can locate injustice, right? And we do make causal statements about these categories precisely because we want to call out grave injustice and, and pinpoint it. So we, we don't want to give up you know, causal statements about this, uh, it would be a huge loss. And, and we use causal statements all the time in, 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 uh, in this context, right? And for a good reason. And also causal explanations are of course a cornerstone of the social sciences. You know, we're, we are interested in causes. So I, I think this is not a route. I think we can give up on, on this as, as uh, you know, um, on these things as causes. Okay, so that's why a lot of uh, especially empirical scientists and uh, applied scientists have turned to what you can call the Ruben Greiner proposal. And this is this idea of moving from race to exposure of race, like the name on a CV. Okay, 
And so uh, you're asking uh, not what is caused by race, but what is caused by the perception of race in the decision maker, okay? So how does a decision maker respond to perceived race of an individual or stimuli of race? And then you hope that somehow exposure to race is something that you can tweak and wiggle and, and, and manipulate experimentally. And hence you kind of have, you know, avoided this problem of talking about race as a cause and you've moved to something that seems like a, an empirical experimental uh, framework. Okay, and so this is the approach taken in many very important audit studies and much empirical work. For instance, the, the um, uh, groundbreaking uh, Bertrand and Melanotan study from 2003, where they um, compared uh, predominantly uh, white, uh, uh, you know, uh, American names with Black American and African American names uh, on CVs and looked at how that changed uh, callback rates and found striking uh, sources of discrimination or striking uh, uh, evidence of discrimination. And it's important. It's, uh, these, these kind of audit studies are very important in locating uh, racism and sexism and discrimination in, in our society. And just to give you a striking example out of Germany, a recent one, a recent uh, audit study by Wechselbaumer, uh, and I, I think this one is just shocking, right? So, um, you know, in Germany, it's customary to put pictures on your CV when you apply for a job. And so here is what happened uh, when you change uh, a German, typical German name, Sandra Bauer, to a, a Turkish name, uh, Miriam Osterk. And uh, then you also change the picture from, uh, uh, you know, to, to have a headscarf uh, on, on top of the, uh, the Turkish uh, name. And so the interview rate would, in that case, drop from 18.8% down to 4.2%. So the right uh, picture would get or the, the left picture would have three times, more than three times the callback rate, uh, almost three and a half times the callback rate of uh, the rightmost picture. So sh shocking, striking, serious, uh, um, you know, discrimination here and bias in, 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 in the interview rates. Um, but so this is important. I don't want to make a case against this, uh, this framework of, of locating discrimination. Um, but there are limitations uh, to the Rubin and Greiner proposal. Um, so first of all, you know, if you think about it, of course, the, the name Merriam on its own has no causal powers, right? It's the name Merriam plus a whole slew of social facts about, uh, you know, uh, the German society and, and, and social facts about Turkish people and Muslim people in the German society that trigger a response, right? So what gives it its ca causal powers is not just the name as as like a, an alphabetical string. It's 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 you know a name uh, you know together with a set of social facts about what that name references. Okay, and so what are those social facts, and where do they come from? And this is where we've in this Ruben Griner proposal. This is where we push the metaphysical problem. We've just you know pushed it away a little bit, so it's out of sight. But it's still, if you ask what is really doing the, the work here as a you know, causal matter, it's the social facts and not the name itself, okay? And so practically this, uh, this metaphysical problem hasn't gone away. This shows up when we try to sort out what to control for in an audit study, okay? So when we decide you know, what are all the things we need to uh, hold constant and what are the things we need to, we need to let vary in our experimental setup, this is when we run into uh, serious sort of conceptual issues, right? For instance, um, okay, I don't have an example here, but let me say that uh, finally, you know, the Ruben Greiner proposal also evaluates a very limited causal effect, right? So just to be clear, in the best case, it sort of evaluates the direct effect of a name in a world where Maryam and Sandra have identical CVs, okay? So in this case, you, you sort of make your counterfactual take you to the nearest world where Maryam and Sandra have identical CVs. And then in that world, you, you entertain the name change. So that's, you know, if that surfaces discrimination, that's, that's interesting. However, you know, we are decidedly not, you know, in a name, in a, in a German uh, society where Maryam and Sandra have typically identical CVs, right? This is the whole point. This is the whole source of, 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 of the causal powers here is that this, you know, the society has that inequality where typically Maryams have different CVs uh, than Sandras. And, and this is the, this is the, uh, the crux, right? And so um, 
it doesn't, you know, the Ruben Griner proposal, it can be used for these audit studies. It's very important empirical work, um, but conceptually it does not give us a, a framework for talking about uh, how social constructs become causes. And so as a result, it doesn't really, it doesn't really provide social explanations, um, but it can sort of, you know, give you smoking gun evidence of, of bias, bias. And so for that alone, it's already very valuable. Um, so let me uh, quote an alternative to the Ruben Griner proposal, which I call the Who Kohler Hausman program. And it's, uh, you know, it's uh, spearheaded by uh, Lily Hu, who's a graduate student at Harvard and Isa Kohler Hausman, who's a faculty member at uh, Yale. And, uh, you know, these two scholars have been working for a number of years now on trying to work out uh, what it means for a social construct to become causes and how we can uh, directly solve this problem rather than trying to avoid it. Okay. And so here's a quote from Lily. So she says that, you know, causal inference paradigms formalized for inquiries in the natural sciences, we typically just transfer them over to the social sciences. And we hope that the kind of causality that we uh, use to talk about biological processes and physical processes map directly to the social sciences, but social causes like race and gender are unlike more standard causes, thereby challenging the usefulness of these theories and methods. Social categories produce causal effects because of how they are constituted by a matrix of social facts. Social constitution and causation must be united in order to understand social causal inference questions. So let me unpack that last statement because it's, uh, it's, it's, it might be a little bit difficult at first. There's this word constitutive, which um, you know, comes up in metaphysics. And uh, there are things called constitutive rules in, in metaphysics. And a constitutive relationship is in some sense, something that tells you that two things co-occur. And that co-occurrence, that metaphysical co-occurrence can produce statistical correlations and things like that. For instance, uh, in the United States, um, a race co-occurs with poverty or co-occurs with, uh, you know, uh, urban density. These are, you know, uh, but it would be hard to argue that one caused the other. These are not causal relationships. You can't say that somehow, uh, you know, race causes urban density or the other way around. That makes no sense. And sure, the, the you know, um, causal uh, analysis people will tell you this means that there are some, uh, back in history, there are some like uh, causal process that was at play that gave you this, uh, this kind of uh, co-occurrence, but that's sort of a very indirect social explanation. A much more direct explanation is that these two factors, urban density and race are co-constitutive, right? So they, 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 they somehow go together um, and that can manifest itself in the data. And it doesn't make sense to talk about one without talking about the other. And so, uh, in some sense, uh, Isa and Lily are trying to uh, reconcile this idea of uh, constitutive rules from metaphysics with the idea of causation. And I think that has a lot of promise in giving us a more meaningful way to talk about social constructs as causes. And so I'm very excited about the work they're doing. It's mostly work in progress and I sometimes check in with them to see how it's going. Um, uh, and uh, I'm fascinated by what they're doing. Uh, one paper that's published is uh, this paper called Eddie Murphy and the Dangers of Counterfactual Causal Thinking, which uh, lays out some of uh, Issa's earlier thoughts on this. Lily has a, a sequence of articles uh, called Disparate Causes, and uh, they have some recent work uh, that you can check out there. I provided the link. Okay. So that was a whole uh, lot to absorb. And in some sense, it's a bit of a shock because I'm, uh, I seem to be questioning uh, kind of the fundamentals here. And I seem to be questioning uh, a lot of the things that we do in causal modeling. And I don't, again, uh, like I said, I don't want to give up on causal statements about these things. I, I think causality and causal explanations have a place in all of this and are important. I just think we, for some of these things, we need to return to the conceptual foundations and understand uh, what we're really talking about. Okay, so I think what's fair to say and this is already important, is that causality clarifies issues such as confounding and mediation, things like Simpson's paradox. And you know, uh, you've saw the tutorial by uh, Stefan and, and, and Bernhard, and, and there's so much interesting work there. And these things, these tools, confounding mediation, those are fundamental for our understanding of data. And I think they're very important, but they do not on their own resolve the normative question of what is fair, okay? So this, uh, this, uh, this question of what's fair, 
uh, remains even after you take a causal perspective. Okay, so put bluntly, if you ask me, there's also no causal fairness definition. Just like there wasn't a statistical fairness definition, I also don't think there's a causal fairness definition. And again, that's not defeatist, that's just sort of like, I don't think that's what it provides. It provides many other valuable things. That's just not what I think it provides. And then the, the point I spend more time uh, discussing is, uh, you know, causal modeling involving social constructs suffers, in my opinion, from an unacknowledged or underappreciated ontological and epistemological problem that are, you know, deep and challenging. So I think these problems are uh, conceptually very challenging and practically relevant, uh, and they're they're essential for what for sorting out what we're even talking about here. Um, and so, in my opinion, uh, work on causality and fair decision making cannot move forward without addressing these problems. And I think we need to pay a bit more attention to that uh, research agenda. Okay, so that's the part about causality. And like I said, it's an ongoing thought process. Um, there's, it's still very open-ended. Um, I'm sharing with you a lot of raw, unfinished thoughts. And, um, you know, my, my thought process on this is very imperfect and uh, not at all at a point of conclusion in some sense, even though I call this like conclusion. So I hope that some of you will pick this up and uh, think about it and, uh, and give me, you know, some new ideas. Okay. With that said, um, I want to come to the second part uh, of the second research thrust and, and, and thing that people have tried to uh, engage with the broader context and to create formalisms that are mindful of the sort of social boundary of our models. Okay, So recall, statistical fairness criteria that we discussed last time are typically thought of as near-term interventions things that you impose on a constraint uh, on, on an algorithm or things that you kind of hope an algorithm satisfies given the data that you're looking at. Um, but as such, they've been criticized for ignoring feedback effects and long-term effects and the surrounding social systems. I remember back in 2017, um, a lot of people voiced these concerns about, hey, this is sort of a near-term localized perspective and it's not taking into account all these salient feedback effects and so on. So motivated by this, uh, you know, I worked with uh, students at Berkeley, Lydia Liu, um, Sarah Dean, Esterov, and Max Simkovitz on this project that we call Delayed Impact of Fair Machine Learning, where we were just trying to get at kind of the simplest feedback problem that we could think about, okay? So we wanted to know, do existing fairness criteria promote long-term welfare improvements for the groups they aim to protect? Okay, so if you apply these fairness criteria, you were to enforce them as a constraint, does that mean that down the road, something good happens? And again, we, we were trying to start at square one and, and figure, we come up with a, the basic, the most basic setup here. And, and the setup that we came up with is just, you have, again, as before, a score, uh, like a credit score, and you have a decision rule that's a threshold of your score, let's say a lending decision, and you have an outcome, let's say a default outcome. And, Think about the lending setting. And so um, the, the basic feedback model that we assumed is the following. If you get accepted for a loan and you pay it back, your score improves by some amount. If uh, you get accepted for a loan and you fail to pay it back, uh, your score diminishes. You have a default and there is, uh, there is harm, you experience harm, and that's manifested in a lower score. Um, and when you don't get accepted in the first place, your, your score remains the, remains the same, okay? So your score wouldn't change. It's very simple, very simple model, okay? Um, just uh, incredibly simple dynamic. And you'll see that, uh, you'll notice that um, we're identifying the score with a welfare measure, because it's an important restriction because we didn't wanna introduce another arbitrary welfare measure um, we just said we're also going to measure welfare in the score of value itself, okay? Which is, a, you know, of course, a strong assumption. Let me see if there are new chat questions. Um, okay, so there are a bunch of questions I missed about the previous part. So let me let's return to those at the end. So Maria and and Abhijit, um, let's. Um, let's talk about those towards the end because they're already about the previous part. 
And I also see that there's new Q&A stuff, so please put that in the chat. I can see the Q&A. Okay, so this is the model, um, very simple. And here's what happened. It was kind of an interesting picture. So we were thinking about the long-term improvement. So in some sense, your score down the road um, and uh, this acceptance threshold of your decision rule. And so if you reparameterize things so that everything just depends on this acceptance threshold, which you can do under some, uh, in some general case, uh, you get some curve that we call the outcome curve. And it's, it's, uh, it looks like this, it has a single hump. It's uh, you know, uh, unimodal. And uh, there's some point here on that curve that's achieved by unconstrained machine learning. There's some point here that you get some amount of long-term improvement that you get if you do nothing at all, if you just uh, take your score and you set the threshold to maximize institutional profit, okay? So to maximize profit for the bank, you would get some kind of um, outcome here. And as you can see from this curve, you could increase your threshold a little bit further and you would get the maximum of this long-term improvement. And that's what we call the philanthropic optimum. So you can slide the threshold a little bit further and you can go from unconstrained uh, from the, 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 the thing achieved by unconstrained optimization to this philanthropic optimum. That's the best you can do. And we call this area of improvement over uh, unconstrained optimization, we call that relative improvement. And we call the other uh, areas uh, relative harm where you, um, you, know, you do worse than uh, no constraint at all. And there's also a sort of an area of active harm where you your long-term improvement actually becomes negative. Okay. And so uh, what we found uh, is that existing fairness criteria in general cause relative harm. Okay, so they're not suitable uh, in promoting long-term well-being. Uh, they tend to uh, overshoot or undershoot and end up in this area of relative harm and sometimes even active harm. So there's a bit of a cautionary tale about, yeah, if you if you want to use these things to, uh, you know, to improve uh, you know, welfare in the long term, that might not be possible by just imposing them as constraints. Okay, it's a fairly basic point if you think about it, but this is what comes out of the model. And if you wanna think about this in terms of dynamical systems, we kind of had a very simple dynamic be, uh, in mind behind this uh, delayed impact setting. So we just sort of envisioned, at least informally, a two variable model where you have a score and you have a decision and your score obviously feeds into the decision um, and uh, then uh, you know your decision affects the score. Okay, you also don't have to create these cyclic models. You can always work with an unrolled uh, acyclic graph, so you can take any uh, cyclic model and you can imagine you just have multiple time steps and you can uh, sort of you know go back to uh, you know uh, an acyclic graph, which you could also uh, interpret causally if 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 you know um, you will. And uh, notably in this work, we only consider a single time step. We didn't sort of iterate this dynamic to infinity. We just kind of assumed one score, one decision, one updated score. So one step, one step feedback model. And so that was, uh, you know, uh, the, the paper. And obviously it left open a lot of questions like what happens with multiple time steps? What happens with uh, more complicated dynamics? What happens when you look at different settings of this? What happens when you try to make this more realistic? Okay, so um, here's a paper, for instance, by Krieger, Madras, Pitassi, and Zemo. It's called Causal Modeling for Fairness and Dynamical System. And it does a really nice job uh, taking all these different dynamics that have been proposed after our paper and uh, turning them into causal DAGs. So directed acyclic graphs, causal graphs, and endowing them with a causal interpretation. So it fits in nicely with what we talked about. So that is, a, that is exercise for our paper uh, and came up with a, a causal model, which actually looks a little bit different than what I had on the previous slide, but it's a, it's a you know, directed basically model for what's going on here. Uh, and I don't want you to parse this because I haven't introduced these letters. So you don't necessarily have to parse this, but just as an example of what this looks like. And then you can simulate these things and they do things like, you know, what happens when you uh, intervene to make everybody's minimum uh, credit score to be 600, right? What kind of uh, simulation results do you get out of this model? And this was also implemented in uh, something called a package called the ML Fairness Gym, a tool for exploring long-term impacts of machine learning systems. Uh, 
uh, that was uh, announced uh, on the Google AI block earlier this year. So um, people like this idea of, of creating these dynamics and simulating them. There are a bunch of other things. Here's a paper by Lily Hu and, and, and Chen um, uh, from around the same time as the, um, as the uh, as the delayed impact paper, it was about labor markets and, and uh, interventions in labor markets and long-term effects in labor markets. And again, Kreger et al. did a nice job creating a dynamical system or a, a, a model for, for this, uh, for this uh, a graph for this model by Hu and Chen. Okay, here's another one, uh, just to show you how much has been done. I'm mostly making an aesthetical point here. Um, so here's an, another paper by Muzanar et al. Uh, where you know uh, they studied um, uh, group dynamics in, uh, in, and this is a structural causal model that captures it. And so again, here's another one for a recommender system introduced by uh, Bunturidis et al. Um, and so you can look at, I encourage you to look at Krager et al for all these different models and their causal graphs if you're excited about this. So I thought, oh my God, this is so cool. I mean, look at this. Uh, there is, uh, there are all these awesome models. There are these dynamics there. We can like start to model things. And I was get, really getting carried away. I was like, gee, what if you could create dynamical models of entire socio-technical systems? What if we could, uh, you know, uh, create models of companies and decision makers and cities or even the whole wide world, okay? So what if we use these models for policy and intervention and social systems? Okay, so this is kind of like me uh, back in the day getting really excited about this, and so I kind of had this like moment of whoa, you know, this is this is amazing. I'm gonna, I'm, you know, it's gonna be that real game changer. And so then I realized uh, it turns out we had uh, tried all of this before, and and uh, you know, uh, 50 years, almost 60 years uh, prior to us. Uh, you know, this kind of thinking was was very uh, common. Okay, so here is uh, uh, you know uh, a model of urban dynamics by Jay Forrester. So Jay Forrester pioneered uh, a discipline called system dynamics in, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and he created uh, he sort of freely created these models of of all sorts of uh, you know social systems. Here was uh, his uh, urban dynamics model. That's quite famous and it models you know the decay of cities and it, it captures things like poverty and, and crime and overpopulation and, and he wanted to see what happens if you introduce the uh, uh, the amount of low income housing in, in a city and what does what what happens and he came up with all sorts of counterintuitive effects based on his simulations and he recommended against low income housing because it would have some counterintuitive long term effects and so on and then he moved on to create a, a world model, which was, uh, it's called World 3. It was uh, um, a major project by the Club of Rome. It was uh, an attempt at, at, at making climate policy and uh, making the point that if we don't control emissions or if we don't control uh, various things in this, in this model, we're gonna, the, the population of the world is gonna overshoot and collapse. Okay, so the point was that around 2050 or something. So in, in, in 30 years from now, we would experience overshoot and collapse if we continued uh, on the current trajectory. So this model might be more, uh, more accidentally more uh, accurate still. But um, and even like it's, it was impressive. Even like in 1958 already, um, Jay Forrester had created these uh, um, industrial dynamics that he used to model like uh, you know inventory and industrial processes and. He had a programming language for punch cards where he uh, implemented these, uh, you know, dynamical models and he simulated them on the hardware of the day. So in many ways, very impressive. Okay, but, you know, so just make, let me make this aesthetic point, right? So I was, I was looking at this work by Forrester and I was looking at the work that had been done in the CS literature and I was just holding it side to side. And I was like, whoa, okay, what, what, is, what is going on? Are we, are we just redoing all this uh, systems dynamic stuff now, are we just arriving at the same kind of modeling that, that was done back, back then, okay? And so this is when I ran into a beautiful article by Kevin Baker called Model Metropolis. And I suggest you all read this. Um, and it says, behind one of the most iconic computer games of all times is a theory of how cities die, one that has proven dangerously influential. And so this article is, a, is about SimCity, 
and how the creator of SimCity, uh, when he wanted to build a city simulator, turned to Jay Forrester's uh, urban dynamics for inspiration. And so it's a it's a great his, uh, uh, you know uh, chapter of history. And uh, Kevin goes into details of how uh, you know bad policy came out of these urban dynamics and how this has been by and large a harmful model. Okay, so Kevin is now one of my postdocs. We were collaborating on a project where we're trying to trace out if there's some sort of rebirth of system dynamics happening here. And our working hypothesis is something like this. As scholars attempt to formalize social systems today, they create dynamical system diagrams that are reminiscent of the system dynamic era. And with it comes the risk of uh, repeating some of the failures of system dynamics. But of course, it's not you know, too late to learn from history. Um, and in fact, Kevin is a historian. He's a historian of science. He's written a, a thesis exactly about computer simulation and the perils of computer simulation, and spe specifically um, system dynamics. And so there's a lot to learn from. And we're trying to you know, um, just create a bit of, of awareness around the, the, the possible failure points of system dynamics here. Um, and one of the big issues that uh, Forrester had and system dynamics generally had is that these models incorporated notoriously unsupported assumptions. Okay, so Forrester actually was aware of this and he called it modeling the symptoms. So Forrester just wanted to have a model which in simulation sort of looked like it was producing the kind of stuff he was seeing in, in, in data, but the causal relationships in these models were in some sense completely made up and he was very suspicious of actually engaging with domain experts on creating these models. He often pulled them up on his own. World 3, for example, I think he did that on a flight. Another, I think there was a story where Kevin came to some archive to look at historical documents by Forrester and he found a large blanket, a bed sheet of sorts. And on this like giant bed sheet, Forrester had drawn uh, a diagram of, of many nodes and arrows and, and whatnot. And so Forrester would often come up with these, uh, these diagrams that uh, had no strong scientific support, but he just uh, you know, believed them anyway as a way of making policy. They also, these models, because you can think of them as causal diagrams, if you will, they also share the same metaphysical and epistemological problem that I, I pointed out earlier. Okay, the other thing that was uh, notorious about these models is that there were often like overly homogenous population level models. And for instance, World 3 was largely a model of the Western economy and captured industrial processes at play in the Western economy, but it wasn't really about the world and it wasn't really like, a, you know, comprehensive and it wasn't heter heterogeneous. It was kind of a very, you know, overly aggregated model, okay? The other issue with these things uh, is what we call a sort of a two trick pony. So these system dynamic models uh, typically exhibited, you know, only two different modes. There was the overshoot and uh, collapse mode and there was the decline mode, right? So it's kind of like what dynamical systems do, right? They always grow exponentially somewhere and then they collapse or, you know, they, they something goes to zero. And so you sort of in these simulations, you kind of kept seeing the same things and it didn't really matter what random seed you used or it was like sometimes you could like create really bad initial conditions that gave you the same thing and and, and so it was it was kind of a strange a strange thing um there's a long um question here by nikki um so let me just finish the last failure point and then go to nikki's question and finally the imp important point to make about these models is that forrester had in mind that these diagrams would actually be legible to policymakers. Okay, so he, he thought of this as a, as a representation of, 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 of knowledge, right? Similar to how we now think about causal diagrams as a representation of scientific knowledge. And he imagined that these, uh, these models would therefore be legible to policymakers. So policymakers would somehow look at these flow charts and diagrams and be like, I get it, that's how it is. But this was not at all true, right? These things were completely illegible to policymakers. You would stare at them and, and, and not get anything. And um, the, 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 the sort of these complicated diagrams didn't, didn't help. Um, and so, okay, these are questions for the end. So I'm just gonna wrap it up soon. And then we have more time for questions. Okay, so, uh, and I'm almost at the end actually. So we have a lot of time for questions.
So my my prod for uh, you know this work in this area is sort of how can we anticipate and, and mitigate these fail, failure points, uh, and how can we be more aware of them? One thing we try to do, and this shouldn't be the only thing, but we created a, a Python package called Why Not. Um, it's available on GitHub. You can check it out, and it's an experimental sandbox for decision making and causal inference in dynamic environments, and it includes all these dynamic models that people have created. Uh, you know from uh, system dynamic models to more sophisticated models like uh, Nordhaus, um, you know, um, uh, climate model that you know, in part won him a Nobel Prize. So important, famous uh, dynamical models that have been proposed over the years are in this package. And you can see for yourself what happens when you uh, play around with them and what happens when you experiment with them and what, what is the sensitivity of certain interventions, what is the robustness of certain interventions, what is the stability of these things and so on. And, and so it's intended to illustrate and anticipate failure points to test robustness and to stress test these kind of models. And it's not created for forecasting of policy. So it has a pretty different angle. It's in some sense, the angle is not, you know, use this to make your forecasts. It's use this to anticipate uh, what the issues are with, with, with your models, okay? And so the lead designer and developer here is uh, John Miller. And lots of contributors from, from Berkeley, Chloe Asu, Jordan Troutman, who's actually an undergrad at uh, uh, the University of Maryland in Baltimore County, uh, Juanqui Perdomo, Tiana Jernick, Lydia Liu, Yusan Ludwig Schmidt, all people in my group who have contributed to this. So thanks uh, to them. And let me uh, wrap up this part of the talk. So uh, again, I think there was a pretty big push a few years ago to attack uh, the sort of fairness community for being too narrow um, and being too much focused on statistics and, and prediction and so on. And there was merit to that critique. Um, uh, there, there are certainly merit, uh, merits to that critique. And, and I think, uh, you know, I was persuaded by this critique. I was motivated by this critique. Um, and it motivated me to embrace this more of a socio-technical systems perspective. Okay, so uh, this broader perspective and think about uh, feedback, dynamics, incentives, uh, you know, all that stuff, economics and markets and the whole, the whole thing that, you know, ties into uh, socio-technical systems and this broader perspective. But at the same time, uh, you know, I realized that socio-technical systems present a very challenging territory for formal methods. Okay, so there's kind of a reason why statistics is so popular because observational, observational statistics are you know, really, um, it's, it's, it's really simple to deal with them. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this idea of like doing things uh, with, you know, less modeling is, is just very appealing because once you go to this idea of modeling entire systems, there is a lot of room for uh, doing things wrong as, as is sort of highlighted in, in uh, the system dynamics case. And so um, in particular, uh, all these socio-technical systems that we're trying to model inherit the metaphysical challenges of causal modeling, and they combine it with uh, new challenges specific to dynamical systems and control theory. Like dynamical systems can be pretty erratic. Control theory is, uh, you know, is a pretty delicate subject, right? To control a dynamical system, you need a lot of inputs usually, you need a lot of stuff. And so working with these dynamical systems can be very challenging. And so there's a little bit of an element of, you know, history repeats itself that I wanted to highlight in this interesting thing of just how, you know, this, this idea of system dynamics, I see that reflected in a lot of the neural work. And uh, I just want us to be aware of the past and, and learn from the history here um, to the extent that we can. So that's basically all I had for this talk. I wanna thank you. And I actually have 15 minutes for questions and that's great because there are a lot of questions already in the chat. So I'm just gonna, again, don't put them on the Q and A, put them on the chat and I will work through them. Um, so let me start backtrack to where we started. I'm just looking at what's the last question um, oh my God, so many questions. So I think the first one I haven't answered is by uh, um, Rinak, or Rinak um, who asks, uh, do, you, uh, um, do you, this hipster example, 
is clearly drawn as a DAG? Maybe do you think this hipster example is clearly drawn as a DAG? Uh, E.g. clothes determine whether somebody is a hipster. Is the causal direction clear? Ah, uh, no problem, you just mentioned. Okay, this was the, sorry, I repeated that question. Um, second question from the MLSSS team. What do you think about the potential outcomes framework and counterfactual in the context of fairness? Um, so I think, you know, I, I'm agnostic to, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine with potential outcomes, uh, you know, and, and uh, whether you derive potential outcomes out of a structural uh, causal model, um, you know, or you assume them and, 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 and you know, they're, you know, I don't want to chime in on that discussion. I, I'm fine if people go about this either way. I don't think that in the context of fairness, it makes a huge difference. Um, I mean, I, you know, I think the graphical perspective has some clear advantages in terms of clarifying the, some assumptions you make and, and, you know, making it easier to talk about things like confounding and mediation. So I think that's a, that's one advantage of that. But normatively, from the perspective of fairness, um, you know, I don't see how potential outcomes is sort of uh, changes things uh, much. Uh, next question by Maria. While identities make poor causal variables, can we at least hope to say if the mediator model is better in explaining data than the confounder model? Um, yeah, so I think the mediator model, you see, I, it's hard for me to say if it's better or, or, or not, because I, I'm, if you, if you can sort of, um, you know, say what the uh, the construct is, or what what you're referencing when you're when you're you know writing that construct as a causal note. Uh, it's not even clear what the mediator would would mean, right? So, for instance, if uh, clothing uh, you know is co-constitutive with being a hipster, then you cannot even separate the clothing mechanism from the hipster mechanism. You cannot say that you know. Uh, what is a hipster who is dressed like, uh, you know, uh, who is dressed in a black suit and, and tie and whatnot, right? Because that's not, a, that's no longer a hipster, right? So if these things are co-constitutive, then you cannot even separate these mechanisms. And so it's hard for me to say which one, which model is better because neither of them kind of gets off the ground because of this uh, issue. So Arvijit is asking, can't help but wonder about the an, an, uh, uh, logical trouble faced by symbolic AI slash semantic web community. What really is referred to by the word hipster and WordNet Wikidata? Uh, the deep learning folks merely map symbols to high dimensional continuous space and let the model figure it out. Yeah, so um, I, I guess the way I would think about this is if we're just doing, you know, statistics and prediction and, uh, you know, uh, that stuff, you can pretend to be very literal. You can say, I'm not going to ask any deep questions here. I'm just going to look at correlations between this label and some other label. And I don't, you know, I'm fine living with this as a label. Okay. And this is part of why like statistics are popular because you don't have to go into metaphors. You can just say, this is a label. Uh, it correlates with some other label and you can, you know, you can leave it at that. You can pretend like that's all you want to know. You only want to know about these um, correlations. Um, at Maria, that's a question of identifiability. You can end up with a Markov equivalence class. Okay, so this was a uh, Lee Moore uh, uh, responding to Maria, not, not a question. Next question is from Nikki Clabertas. Uh, the ontological question has connections to the discussions about granularity. Abstract causal nodes like GDP, health of institutions, also often do not themselves cause anything but are constitutive quantities. However, economics or economists may still believe in stable mechanisms relating these nodes in a directed causal way once we fix a stable measurement procedure for them without knowing on which granularity level the actual effects take place. Therefore, they argue for the existence of stable structural equations between them. How much of the additional difficulty in fairness comes from the social construct part and the related measurement challenges? Also still on causality, so can be deferred to. Okay, yeah, great question, deep question. So, um, interesting, yeah. So you're saying, let's take a cue from 
you know, economics where you're creating the equivalent of some structural causal model about, you know, the economy and how things in, in the marketplace relate to each other. And uh, these things on their own might not have any causal powers, but are, uh, you know, um, sort of granted their causal powers by virtue of some facts that we hold to be true, like, you know, the power of the Federal Reserve or, you know, the meaning of a dollar bill and so on. And so, yeah, I think this is a big difference. So um, it's fine by me, it's fine if a causal model is specific to, let's say, an economy. It's fine if the uh, causal model encapsulates facts, right? It is the causal model has to encapsulate knowledge about something. It's fine if that knowledge is localized. You can create sort of localized, specialized causal models about particular things like the US economy or some, some particular market in the economy. And that doesn't necessarily run into the same problem. You could have that, you know, you could have it such that the facts that we have about this thing um, make these mechanisms modular and make these mechanisms stable and give you the ability to create a, uh, you know, a structural causal model. Right. Um, and so, yes, I think, you know, that there is a, a, certainly additional challenge with the social constructs uh, in, in doing this. Um, OK, so and I, may, I might have missed some other parts of this question. It sounds very deep. It sounds like you've already thought about this a lot. And, uh, you know, I would love to hear more from you maybe later on. Um, and uh, you might have already thought about this more than I have. So um, next question is from Laura. Since racial or sexist discrimination often has political links and or rep repercussions, what would you say to people who think politics should be kept out of machine learning or science in general? Is trying to be apolitical or political a stance itself? Um, this is a good question. Yeah, so, um, I, you know, I don't see how machine learning can be apolitical, right? I don't think our, it, you know, anything that has consequences can be, uh, can be apolitical. So yeah, I think we certainly need to retire the idea of, uh, you know, uh, a, a neutral science that we have. I think that that doesn't make any sense, right? And so um, this go goes into a whole another conversation that we can maybe later have in the in the group session, uh, and I can say more about this. But yeah, just to answer this briefly, I don't I don't think there's any any way of pretending that uh, we're not uh, part of a political system and part of uh, you know. Uh, and what we do has political, uh, you know, import. Um, this question was apparently inspired from an archive paper linked to here. Um, I'm not going to open that right now. Maybe later. Uh, Jan is saying, "I have lost sight of what the goals of these models are. Do we find? To, do we want to find causes for unfairness? Are we looking for remedies? Proof? Yeah, good point. Right. So yeah, there was a bit of a um, jump here in that." Um, you know, uh, Forrester was, of course, not specifically uh, interested in questions of discrimination, but just in questions of public policy, right? But he definitely, you know, created these models to sort out policy and, and allocation in uh, consequential uh, settings that affected, uh, you know, people, right? So like his urban policy and this idea that uh, low income housing leads to overcrowding and hence harms the city, right? So this is, you know, this was a, a, a political position and, and, and public policy recommendation that he justified with these models. So yeah, these models are a little bit broader in that they're not specifically about discrimination anymore, but are about, uh, you know, uh, structural interventions, for example. And that is exactly sort of where the community is, is, uh, was headed, right? And, and saying, okay, let's not only talk about discrimination by decision makers, but let's try to capture structural forces and structural discrimination. And part of the idea behind creating these dynamical systems was to talk about things like structural discrimination. Um, so next question from Indira Sen. Uh, is the hacking instability related to performance prediction? Um, and can ideas developed in the letter also extend to the, to the consequences of the hacking instability? Great question. I think of them as analogous. I think of hacking instability as being, uh, you know, some some kind of feedback loop that's very similar to what's happening in performance prediction. But hacking instability refers to sort of what is a social uh, 
uh, category and, and it happens more at a metaphysical level, whereas performance prediction describes more of a feedback loop and between your predictions and your data. But yeah, I think, you know, um, th there's definitely some related relation here, right? And, and so also relations between uh, this hacking looping effect and, and Goodhart's law and so on. So I think uh, that's, a, that's a good question to think a, a bit more about. Uh, next question from Pedro, um, is moral irrelevance dependent on context and culture? If so, will we have different concepts of fairness depending on such? Yes, absolutely. So the notion of moral ir irrelevance, which I guess I mentioned somewhat informally last time and on Tuesday, um, is certainly culture specific, right? You know, there was a time and time dependent, right? There was a time where uh, you know, it, you know, their societies just like openly had the ability to discriminate based on things that have become protected, uh, attributes, right? There was, uh, you know, um, let me, let me give you an example, right? So uh, the fact that you attach an image to a CV in Germany, but you can't do that in the U S right. That's, that's a, that's a cultural difference. We consider in the U S we consider the face of someone morally irrelevant for the application uh, uh, and their CV, and it that's, has nothing to do, has no place on it. And in Germany, it's not considered morally irrelevant. And you know, people might say, oh, well, look, I mean, I wanna see what the applicant looks like. And there's a different moral understanding here why that, that is still accepted in Germany. So certainly uh, this leads to different concepts. And there, there are, of course, more striking examples as well. Um, uh, question by uh, Mini, and I hope I, didn't completely mispronounce that name. What do you think about approaching the problem in terms of psychosocial, a psychosocial perspective that is focusing on modeling the motives or reasons for unfairness and perhaps approaching the ontological perspective subjectively? Great question. Yeah, so I was just earlier this year, I was at the annual uh, convention for uh, social psychology, SPSP, and uh, this question was definitely very much on my mind. Like, you know, can we talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, this topic of discrimination more from a social psychology perspective? And, uh, you know, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I haven't explored this much further, but I think that's, um, that's certainly the kind, the kind of conversation I had with a bunch of attendees. Um, I wouldn't, I don't necessarily see how, I mean, it, it would definitely change the kind of empirical work that we do. Um, I wouldn't necessarily see how it changes, um, you know, uh, the uh, ontological perspective. Um, or I guess you mean like, um, yeah, that's okay. I definitely hadn't thought that far. I definitely hadn't thought about how social psychology comes into the ontological problem. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I, I don't have no, no thoughts on this. Um, next question is by Katerina. Um, how can we hope to create a correct causal model when the causal sources are subjective? Uh, E.g. the slide with education, religion, decision example, when uh, different authors made different graphs. Um, yeah, so uh, this is part, this is, you know, great question. This is kind of the whole issue here, right? Like, how do we decide what a valid causal model is? Um, and how do we come to accept these different causal models? And I guess this is sort of, um, in some sense, the second question about epistemology, right? Where, where do we, you know, once we sorted out the ontology, where, where do we come up with the facts that we need to decide which one is the correct causal model? And in cases where these nodes uh, are have sort of a subjective interpretation and and uh, and so on, that that is a challenging and contentious uh, uh, endeavor, right? So. Um, this is de definitely the, the sort of issue that we run into and why I think that these are important questions to engage with because uh, you'll have to resolve them to sort out what is the correct causal model, even saying what correct might mean, what valid might mean, exactly. Okay, Whew. great questions and uh, lots of them. I really love the engaged audience. Uh, we have another hour of like offline questions, um, uh, you know, that can go into more detail where I hope to have more of a dialogue. Um, we're also hitting 1030. So it's the 90 minute mark, um, which is supposed to be the end of the time slot. Wait, it, it's 90 minutes, right? Yes. Yes. It's okay. very, we're basically right on time. Perfect. Yeah.
All right, so this uh, is maybe a good point to take a break. Right. Um, so thanks a lot, Maurit, for a wonderful talk. And I like the way that you moderate yourself. So I don't have to do a lot of work here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think um, just a reminder that we will have a um, roundtable discussion with Maurit again in half an hour. And I hope that uh, everyone can join and have a, a, a fruitful discussion together on the topic of fairness. I think um, there's a lot of uh, open question and, and, and many open problems that we can try to, to discuss and maybe we can come up with a good solution or maybe not. But I hope we will see each other in, in half an hour. All right, okay, you thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moritz. Thank you for the talks, it was amazing. Amir? Okay, is Mila here, Mila? Amir? Mila. Almost, almost done with the stream. Okay.